Thank you for downloading episode 38 of the Murder Mile True Crime Podcast. If you enjoyed listening to Murder Mile and want to support the show, please do leave a review on iTunes or even the podcast app you're listening to right now, as it brings the show to a wider audience, ensures its future, and recently, your five-star reviews rocketed Murder Mile into iTunes Top 50 Podcasts. Ooh, so your support is truly appreciated. Thank you for listening, and enjoy the episode. Welcome to Murder Mile. A true crime podcast, an audio guided walk, featuring many of London's untold, unsolved, and long-forgotten murders, all set within one square mile of the West End. Today's episode is about Martin Vic Magnusson, a bright, loving, and vivacious student who travelled from Norway to study in London, but was murdered at the hands of a friend. And although her brutal death has been solved, more than ten years on, her killer has never been brought to justice. Murder Mile contains unsettling details, which may make the timid tremble, as well as realistic sounds, so that, no matter where you listen to this podcast, you'll feel like you're actually there. My name is Michael, I am your tour guide, and this is Murder Mile. Episode 38 Justice for Martin Vick Magnusson. Today, I'm standing outside of Seaford Court at 222 Great Portland Street, W1. One road west of Gosfield Street, where the West End's most infamous strangler murdered his third victim. One street south of Regent's Park, where the provisional IRA exploded two bombs, killing 11 people and injuring 50. And just a few streets south of Hampstead Road and Gloucester Crescent, where two more possible victims of the Blackout Ripper were murdered. Coming soon to Murder Mile. Situated just north of Oxford Circus, where a Soho is the home of every hobo, homo, hipster, ponce, pervert, and deeply desperate extrovert, being its bastard little brother, Fitzrovia is little more than a halfway house for those moody, vague, ashen-faced arseholes who aren't as rich, hip, and famous as they think they are, Hence they live on a street where every building looks like an accountant's. Being a place where no one bothers to stop, Great Portland Street is a pretentiously hideous concrete jungle, unaware of how truly shit it really is. As outside of its endless uptight eateries sits a slew of grumpy gits and frumpy sows, all dressed in fur coats, fedoras, and painfully tied facelifts, who sip bellinis on its curbside tables, <laughs> like they were sunning it up on the French Riviera. Whereas actually, every time they chug back an oyster, they choke on a caustic mouthful of dust, truck fumes, and the whiff of poodle plop. Yep, Great Portland Street truly is an awful place. Now renamed The Armitage, Seaford Court at 222 Great Portland Street is a semi-exclusive set of serviced apartments. With a stark black and glass-fronted facade on the ground floor, which makes it look like a funeral parlour, a storage vault in the basement, which again is ironic given its history, and with a five-storey red-brick mansion block above. Built in a faux-Parisian style, 
Here you can rent a flat, once owned by a minor celebrity, a failed pop star, and maybe even a murderer. As it was here, on Friday the 14th of March, 2008, the 23-year-old Martine Vick Magnusson was lured back to the flat of a close friend and murdered. As a bitter Norwegian wind blew across the icy frozen tundra, in the early hours of Wednesday the 6th of February 1985, the deathly silence was cut short by the sharp squeal of tyres and the roar of a high revving engine. As a set of Saab headlights ripped along the pitch black coastal road from Nasoya to Oslo. To the left, darkness. To the right, the sea. Eerily still and black, like blood in the moonlight. Behind the steering wheel, fighting the grip as the speeding and weaving car blew through every stop sign, red light and roadblock, was 25-year-old Erd Peter Magnusson. Being a tall, slim man, with wavy blonde hair, and a kindly yet concerned face. Although for the first time in his life he'd broken several traffic violations, Peter wasn't a criminal, a fugitive or a maniac, but a loving father. And as a series of pained screams echoed from the back seat, between the legs of his heavily pregnant wife, a tiny blonde crown of hair peeped out. As their excitable second child got bored of waiting and with a new world to explore and no time to waste, out she popped, just inside of the doors of Oslo Hospital. With wide hazel green eyes, soft blonde hair and a bright beaming smile, as Peter held his perfect little girl in his arms. He promised that he would always love her and protect her. The childhood of Martin Vig Magnusson could easily be described as idyllic, and as the beloved middle child of two loving parents, who was adored by her older brother, Magnus, and younger sister, Matilda, she grew up surrounded by love, joy and happiness. On the small beautiful island of Nusoya, 25 miles southeast of Oslo, the Magnusson family lived in a little wooden cottage on the brow of a hill overlooking a stunning snowy fjord. And with the air being fresh, the water being clean and the streets being safe, as an active child, here Martine could run, swim and play, all day. But being an inquisitive girl, with a thirst for knowledge and an adventurous spirit, coming from a remote island, her family knew that one day that she would leave to see the world. As a popular, generous and honest girl, with a heart so big, it's amazing it managed to fit into her five foot, four inch frame. Being bright, kind and bubbly, Martine was beautiful, inside and out. Every summer, when the Norwegian snow had melted into crystal clear streams and crisp blue lakes, in a little wooden hut nestled on the shoreline at the bottom of the family garden, Martine would host parties for her nearest and dearest, singing, dancing and cooking treats. And as an instantly likeable young lady, with no enemies, just friends, Peter described his daughter as pure sunshine.
So, I guess you're probably expecting to hear about a horrific incident in her idyllic childhood. Maybe involving drugs, death, debt or disaster. Where everything she ever loved fell apart and her life was changed forever. But it didn't. In fact, the worst thing that happened was the divorce of her parents when Martine was just 15. But as a loving couple, deeply committed to their children, they amicably split and remained close, spending birthdays, Christmases and holidays together. Encouraged by her doting father to be confident, independent and ambitious, having once dreamed of being a prima ballerina, a show jumper and a professional netballer, after graduation from Christelig Gymnasium, a private Christian school in Oslo, in February 2007, Martine moved to London and later enrolled in an international business relations degree at Regent's Business School, barely a 15-minute walk from Seaford Court. The five-storey red-brick mansion block at 222 Great Portland Street. As a dynamic girl in a bustling city, 23-year-old Martine academically thrived, emotionally blossomed and socially flourished. And although she was over a thousand miles from home, she lived well, stayed safe and made many new friends. One of whom was Farouk Abdullak. Born in Sana, the capital city of the Arab sovereign state of Yemen, on the 18th of February 1987, Farouk Abdullak was the eldest son of Egyptian and Yemeni parents. And although the Yemen is the poorest country in the Arabian Peninsula, with half of the population living on less than one pound a day, and with limited access to fresh fruit and clean drinking water, the life of Farouk Abdullak was very different. Raised in opulence, wealth and privilege, Farouk was the first-born son of billionaire Shaha Abdullak. Dubbed the King of Sugar, owing to his business interests in Coca-Cola, and as a powerful man with many influential allies, Farouk's father was a close personal friend of the Yemeni president, and his personal net worth of $9 billion was the equivalent of one-tenth of his country's annual income. As future heir to his father's fortune, Farouk attended Azal Hadar Primary School in Salah. He was educated in the traditional core values of Islam, tolerance, abstinence and compassion. And although a lot rested on such a small set of shoulders, Farouk was friendly, respectful, pleasant, polite and shy. The kind of guy his school friend said wouldn't hurt a fly. Being five foot and seven inches tall, slim and toned, with chestnut eyes, cropped dark hair and a neatly trimmed designer beard. Being dressed in the latest brands, gold chains and snazzy trainers. Although slightly vain, 21-year-old Farouk was an unremarkable young man who looked like almost any other wealthy Arab son, raised in the West on an excess of money, freedom and privilege. Eager for the offspring of his ever-expanding empire to be well-educated, Farouk's father sent his son to some of Britain's top boarding schools. And although Farouk rebelled against his strict Islamic father by drinking, smoking and professing to be agnostic, in September 2007, 
He enrolled in an international business relations degree at the Regent's Business School in London, where he met Martin Vick Magnuson. So, I guess you're probably expecting to hear about a horrific incident in his idyllic childhood, maybe involving drink and drugs, guns and gangsters, massacres and mental illness. Of how a shy boy became a psychopath, and his life was changed forever. But it didn't. Farouk was a billionaire's son, living in London, studying by day, partying by night, and although he was four and a half thousand miles from home, the worst thing that happened to Farouk was the pressure. Of having to uphold his family's honor. So, as far as we know, Farouk had no reason to kill Martine, but he did. In June two thousand and seven, Martine moved into a modest four-bedroom flat just off Chelsea Bridge Road, in a safe, local, and well-lit part of town. That she shared with three Norwegian friends, and which she funded by working a part-time job at the Mulberry Clothing Store in Mayfair. And as a confident girl who liked the nightlife, Martine never took risks with her safety. She was street smart, careful, and cautious. She didn't walk home at night. She didn't hitchhike. She never accepted lifts from strangers, and if any of her flatmates decided not to come home, the rule was: always text, always stay in touch. And Martine always did. Her female friends would often joke that there were no men left in London, as they were all in love with Martine. And as a mesmerizing woman. Who had an innate ability to make everyone feel special, warm, and loved. Some men fancied Martine, whereas others were besotted. Farouk and Martine had known each other for eight months, and to the best of our knowledge, they never dated, fought, kissed, or fornicated. Although it was obvious that Farouk fancied her. He never asked Martine out, and she never rejected him. They were just two good friends. One of whom would end up dead. The murder of Martine Vig Magnusson is part of an ongoing investigation, so the following details are based on the limited information available. Therefore, there will be gaps, lapses, and loose threads. Thursday, the thirteenth of March, two thousand and eight, was a night for celebration, as not only was this the end of term for the students of the Regent's Business School, but in her exams, Martine had come top of the class, being eager to drink, dance, and let off steam. Martine, Farouk, and several school friends headed out to a boutique nightclub called Maddox at numbers three to four Mill Street in fashionable Mayfair. Stylishly dressed in skinny blue designer jeans, a fawn-colored vest top, and brown snakeskin shoes, which she accessorized with Christian Dior earrings, a silver watch by Guess. And a black leather Marc Jacobs handbag, and with her trademark blonde hair, pink lipstick, and silver eyeshadow, as Martine slinked down the spiral staircase into the club's pseudo-futuristic backlit facade, she seemingly blended in amidst a sea of students and socialites, singing, dancing, mingling, and laughing. By all accounts. A fabulous night was had by all, and nothing 
out of the ordinary happened. There were no fights, spats, strops, huffs, tuts, tears or bad blood spilt. It was an evening perfectly summed up by one of the many photos taken that night. One in particular shows Martine and Farouk, two friends in a gentle embrace, her arm draped over his shoulder, and both of them are happy, smiling and relaxed. At 3.20am, with her pooped out friends eager to sleep, and a full of beans Martine, desperate to dance till dawn, outside of the Maddox Club, they parted ways. And having misplaced her mobile phone one week prior, her flatmates knew not to expect a text from Martine. And besides, she was with Farouk, so they knew that she'd be safe. A few moments later, Martine and Farouk hopped in a black cab on Mill Street and headed north into Fitzrovia. That was the last time that anyone saw Martine alive again. On the morning of Friday the 14th of March 2008, her bleary-eyed flatmates spotted that Martine's bed hadn't been slept in. Her snakeskin shoes weren't scattered on the floor. Her Mark Jacobs handbag wasn't slung over the door. And although she didn't have a phone, she knew the rules. And no matter what, she would normally find a way to say that she was safe. But she hadn't. They messaged her via Facebook. No reply. They called all of her friends. No sighting. They called Farouk. No answer. And growing even more concerned, as day turned to night, they retraced her last known steps. But no one had seen her. Having been missing for 24 hours, Martine's disappearance was reported to the police. But being a popular foreign student in London on a bank holiday weekend, it was assumed she was partying, and so no search was done. But then again, Martine wasn't the only person who'd gone missing that night. Unusually for such a media-savvy man, shortly after his arrival home, Farouk switched his mobile off. Strangely, for such a social climber, the door to his flat remained firmly shut. And in a sinister twist, at roughly 4am, barely 40 minutes after he and Martine had hopped into a black cab, Farouk updated his Facebook status. It simply read, Farouk is home alone. One day later, he deleted his profile completely. Knowing their friend and fearing the worst, Martine's flatmates approached the police with their findings and pestered them to call on Farouk. And seeing the clues before them leading to something unseemly, PC James Tauber was dispatched to Seaford Court at 222 Great Portland Street. Furuk wasn't home. He hadn't been for more than a day. And with his clothes, his phone, his wallet, his bag and his passport missing, it looked like wherever he'd gone, he'd left in a hurry. And although she was nowhere to be seen, the officer instinctively knew that Martine had been there and that something bad had happened to her. 
as sprawled across the plush white carpet, in a crumpled messy heap, lay her fawn-coloured vest top. And like a grisly version of Hansel and Gretel, pointing towards the flat's front door, in an ominous spotted line, were rivulets of little red dots. As P.C. Tauber traced the sporadic speckles of congealed blood down the cold stone stairs, as his booted feet echoed off the hard walls, his ghastly treasure hunt ended, as the crimson spots came to a dead stop at a basement door. Its padlock dotted with dried and crusted blood. At 10.20am on Sunday the 16th of March 2008, in the damp, dark and unlit basement of 222 Great Portland Street, the semi-clad body of 23-year-old Martine Vick Magnusson was found, hastily dumped under a pile of builder's rubble, as her left arm protruded from a mess of sand and cement in a rushed attempt by her killer to conceal his crime. Martine had been raped and strangled. The next day, Martine's doting father, who just 23 years earlier had raced through the icy Norwegian tundra from Nasoya to Oslo to ensure the safe birth of his beautiful baby daughter, had flown from Oslo to London to undertake a duty which no father should ever have to do. In the sterile coldness of the mortuary, on an aluminium gurney, draped in a blue plastic sheet, lay the body of Martine Magnusson. And although the police told Peter everything he needed to know to prepare him for the sight he was about to see, that she had been strangled, that she had been raped, and that she had fought for her life. It would never be enough, as lying in front of him was his daughter, all cold and lifeless. And although her flawless skin was mottled with a mix of yellow, brown and purple bruises, with her face swollen, her tongue protruding, and her neck etched with an oddly shaped mark. It was the little details which brought the most pain for Peter. He would later say of that day, she looked like Martine. She still had her eyeshadow on. And as she lay there, and his trembling hand stroked her cold face, even as an unemotional man, Peter was reduced to tears at the sight of his beautiful baby, dead. Forensic pathologist Dr. Nathaniel Carey confirmed that Martine had 43 substantial injuries to her head, face, neck and body. And although toxicology tests confirmed that she had consumed 130 milligrams of alcohol and a small amount of cocaine, Consistent with any weekend drinker or recreational user, she was fully conscious at the time she was raped, and that the unusual mark across her neck was consistent with compression, as if she'd been pinned to the floor by an object, a hand, or a foot. Almost ten years on, the murder of Martine Vick Magnusson remains unresolved, but not unsolved. After a short police investigation, although they only had one suspect, they knew who he was, where he was, and they knew and could prove that he was guilty. His name was Farouk Abdullah. The problem was, they couldn't arrest him. 
on the afternoon of Friday the 14th of March 2008. Having erased his Facebook profile, packed his bags and pocketed his passport, Farouk boarded a flight from London Heathrow to the Egyptian capital of Cairo, where he was spirited out of the country to Sansa in Yemen, in his billionaire father's private jet. Although his whereabouts cannot be verified, it is said that Furuk is hidden in the remote village of Thaba Abwas in southern Yemen. He's grown a beard to blend in with the strict Islamic culture. He studied Arabic at the local university. He recently married a divorced Yemeni woman. And although a European warrant was issued for his arrest, as neither Britain nor Norway have an extradition treaty with the Yemen. It is unlikely that Farouk Abdullah will ever be arrested, imprisoned or convicted. And as of today, he remains the one and only suspect in the murder of Martin Vik Magnusson. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening to Murder Mile. Don't forget to stay tuned to Extra Mile after the break. But before that, here is my recommended podcast of the week, which is Bloody Murder. Hi, I'm Barney Black. And I'm Tara Saraban. And we do Bloody Murder. We're a weekly true crime podcast that focuses on some of the lesser known crime stories from Australia. And indeed around the globe. We're a comedy podcast with a dark sense of humour. But we're dead serious about murder and the people it affects. We find humour in some unexpected places. But never at the expense of the victims or their families. We've been described as the blue cheese of podcasting. Addictive, strong and satisfying. And a bit stinky. I am not. You know you are. Bloody Murder. Hello, I have a parcel here for uh, Mr. and Mrs. Extra Mile. Oh, come on in, come on in. Yes, it's here. I just put the parcel down there. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Extra Mile are busy at the moment, but they will come down and they will open the parcel shortly. Thank you very much. Ooh, what's the parcel? Du, 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 du. Opens the parcel. It's me, Waffling. Hello, everyone. <laughs> it's me again, uh, your host, Michael. Hello. Uh, I don't know why I always say Michael on the podcast, because I, I hate being called Michael. I really do. It's one of those weird things where I started it at the start. I think because I do it on my tour, I, I say, my name is Michael. I'm your tour guide on the on the walk. Uh, but I hate being called Michael. I don't hate it. I just, it's, I like Mike. Or I have many, many nicknames. Uh... Anyway, uh, Extra Mile, um, you guys can probably say this with me if you like, uh, to anyone who's new to this section, this is Extra Mile, this is the unscripted bit, there's no sounds, there's no music, there's no, it's not edited in any way, it's kind of just like, it's just me talking about the episode that uh, we've just listened to, uh, what I do in this section is I give you extra details. Because often there's uh, just there's just no time. Sometimes, like if I were to give you all the information on a case, you'd be so bored. Because some cases are really dull, really, really, really repetitive and dull. So what I try and do is just just make it make it fun without you know without ha- doing a hatchet job on the story. I just try and make it right and uh, honest and tell it from a perspective. So whether it's the victim's perspective, perspective or sometimes it's uh, uh, the killer's perspective. I'm just going to have a quick drink. Oh, God, that was good. That was a hot one. So currently at the moment, uh, today, it's twenty. It's 33 degrees, which uh, 33 degrees in real money uh, or in not real money. It's just about to hit over 100 degrees Fahrenheit today. Uh, I'm out on the canal. I'm in my little uh, metal boat. Um, and even in the morning, if you touch the boat, it gets... It is, like it's hot the tarmac outside is hot the boat is hot uh i'm in a quiet place which is good and i thought to myself oh this might be good maybe i can record with all the windows and doors open so i can get some fresh air unfortunately aircraft flying over pathetic little men who've decided to buy a little crappy little glider flying over and there's there's some geese so i had to close all the windows and doors so i just had to record that episode 
with all the windows and doors shut and I am dripping in sweat now. It's it's a horrific sight, really. I I, I was having to use my T-shirt to mop my eyes while because I couldn't see the screen because it was just sweat pouring into my eyes. Uh, so I hope it sounds good. And I hope I, I hope I can edit out the sound of my laptop dying because my laptop, the fan was going, Wee! it's doing all right now. It's not, it's gone a bit quiet because I've just literally opened up all the windows and doors and I've just got myself a nice little cold drink. I bought a bag of ice about, about an hour ago. It's almost all melted now. It is that bloody hot. I'm going to have to get some more ice later on. Anyway, right. Um, so that was the uh, murder of Martin Vig Magnusson um, by Farouk Abdullah. You can tell I'm starting to enjoy doing the uh, Middle Eastern uh, Arabic accents now after episode three. I quite enjoyed saying Farouk Abdullah. And uh, his father's name as well, I've forgotten it already. Shaha Abdullah. Oh, I wonder if I'm Middle Eastern. I wonder if I am. I wonder if there's something, some, something in my side my bones that says, "Oh, you're Middle Eastern." Uh, but I do, I do love the pronunciation. Do you know how some languages are kind, kind of? I know everyone goes on about French being a beautiful language. I don't think so. I love, I love things like the Middle East. It's many of the Middle Eastern accents, the, the the way that the words form, like like even just saying, even though he's a murderer, and I hate to say it, Farouk Abdullah. I love to just even it's not guttural, but there's something that there's kind of a nice role to the way that some of the words are formed. If anyone out there is a linguist, get in touch. Uh, let me know what the, what it is that I'm saying. Would you know uh, not the words, but would you know how it's uh, how it's formed in the mouth. I love things. I love hearing that kind of stuff. I love geeky stuff. So the murder of uh, Martin Vich Magnussen. Uh, obviously, as you can appreciate, this is an ongoing murder investigation. Although it is effectively solved uh until they can arrest him until they can he can go to trial he is still technically innocent as we say innocent and proven guilty so a lot of the information uh, hasn't been released by the police quite rightly because they don't want to prejudice the case they don't want to prejudice any juries so very limited information is out there that so i mostly got uh, a lot of this from different news articles the great thing is um uh Ud Peter Magnusson, her father, uh, has been running a campaign for years called Justice for Martine. Um, there's a really good website out there that he's that he's got. He's put lots of information on there. He is constantly out, rightly him and his family, trying to keep the memory, not just the memory of Martine alive, but keep the case in for in 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 everyone's memories. Because the problem is that if if they let this billionaire's son hide away behind um, the fact that there's no extradition treaty. He will get away with the fact that he committed murder. And he's got away with it for 10 years now. Um, so I used, a, uh, I used a lot of uh, articles based on uh, what her father has said. Uh, there was uh, some transcripts from the coroner's trial. Although there hasn't been a, a, um, a murder trial yet, because obviously we don't have... Farouk in this country there was a coroner's trial um held by Nathaniel Carey uh to determine the cause of death and the the cause of death was a strangulation caused by compression of the neck um so uh so or, or, so I technically I didn't have the uh, original police murder investigation file that I would have liked for this case hence I've done it more less as a kind of uh, anatomical as I'd nor normally do, but what I've done is base it more on her kind of movement and what she was like as a person, because uh, I think that's really important. So uh, let's dive in and get some more information about this. So there's some sections that I didn't put in that I took out, so I'm going to read you some of this, if that's okay. Luckily, I've pre-read this before, so anyone who knows about my dyslexia will wonder why I'm reading through this quickly. It's because I, because I, I wrote most of it. So, I, yeah, so I'm, things have, as I said last week, if you pre-read things, uh, I've, I've got quite a retentive memory. So it looks like I'm reading, but really I'm just remem remembering it. Uh, so, um, this case. Uh, the le legal situation is complicated by the fact that Yemen doesn't have an extradition treaty with the United Kingdom or Norway. Um which would really help uh, Scotland Yard with the, with the uh, uh, diplomatic cooperation which they need to get Farouk from Yemen to here. Um, now, this is even more complicated by the fact 
that um, Farouk, when he... See, I'm not reading this now. I'm, I'm going from memory. I have decided not to read this. Uh, when Farouk did... Uh, when he left the United Kingdom and he flew to Cairo, then he got his daddy's his daddy's private jet uh, to Sana, which makes you wonder why his father hasn't been arrested for, a, you know, uh, 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 assisting a fugitive. Really, he should be the person that's arrested first. They, but obviously, he's a billionaire. So, um, what? Uh, what the, the first thing that Farouk did was went to go and see his father's lawyer and said, this is what ha ha has happened. The police want to arrest him. Uh, they've said that uh, they're not willing to let Farouk go back to the United Kingdom to be tried, but they are willing to allow him to be tried in his own country. Now, the, now that might sound good. You might think, well, at least we can kind of try in one way or another. But the problem is... Um, if he were to be found guilty in his own country, which is the Yemen, the death penalty for the, sorry, the penalty for murder in the Yemen is death penalty, is execution. And the problem is because the United Kingdom and Norway don't agree with the death penalty, therefore we're unwilling to allow the trial to commence in the Yemen. So basically, it's it's a catch twenty two. We haven't got an extradition treaty to bring him over here to be tried in British courts, and therefore he will face life in prison. But also, we can't allow him to be tried in the Yemen because he will be executed, which uh, British government and the Norwegian government don't agree with. Um, now, even worse thing is, you would think, well, surely uh, everyone walks around. And sees Farouk Abdullah. They look at the news and they go, "Oh, look, there's that rapist and that murderer." Mm, no, it doesn't happen that way. Because don't forget, his father is incredibly powerful. So the first thing he did, because his father has political influence, it, you know, he's friends with the prime minister of, of Yemen. Uh, he's very powerful in the government. Uh, he, I was reading something the other day that he is. Um, not only does he have connections with Coca-Cola, Xerox, Philips, you know, some of the biggest names in the world uh, and as i mentioned his uh, personal wealth is the equivalent of uh, one tenth of the country's whole gdp so he's incredibly influential and close friends with the prime minister um there is no mention in any yemeni newspapers or on any tv uh, uh news channels or anything that Farouk abdullah is a murderer and a rapist it is not mentioned it is not brought up because obviously his father has incredible influence and power and they know that his father can just turn around and go, right, I'm taking this away. And given the fact that the Yemen is a massively impoverished country where you've got, you've got billionaires in one part just literally soaking up everything and then you've got people living on less than a pound a day, starving to death and dying of thirst. It's an incredibly unfair country and his father has extensive financial resources and powerful political allies and basically he can do whatever he wants and if his son is a murderer he and a rapist he can just fly his jet to another country pick his son up bring him back and then no one could do anything about it and it's incredibly unfair it's quite interesting that this story is, is really a story not just about martin and farouk but this is a story about different types of parents this is a story about two parents protecting their offspring You've got Ud Peter Magnusson. I apologise. I know it's Ad, but I find that difficult to pronounce and it sounds awful. So I say Ud Peter Magnusson. Um, uh, Martin's father, devout father, absolutely loving. There's some wonderful photos. Oh, Michael, don't cry again. No, remember what happened last week. Uh, we've got lovely photos online. I'll try and post them online, which is, um, I, th I think it was when Martin was in her teens. And she was doing some uh, photo shoot with her family. It says lovely pictures of her with her mom and her sister and her brother and her grandma. And there's a really lovely one of uh, Martine on like getting a piggyback off her dad. And it's just uh, I'll try and post it. It's a, it's a really nice photo, and I think it really sums up their their relationship. You know, a loving, protective father, not overprotected because he wanted his daughter to flourish, but at the same time, you know, loved her, wanted to make sure she she was safe. And then on the other hand, you've got Abdullah's. Um, Farouk Abdullah's father, uh, Shaha Abdullah. There we go. I knew I'd have that written somewhere. Shah Shaha Abdullah. Um, uh, just being an incredibly rich man who 
has decided that his son is going to take over his empire. He's, he's next born. Uh, he doesn't really have a choice in it. He's going to he's going to be put into an ex, uh, an arranged marriage. I didn't put that in the story, but that's in there. That's he was knew that he was going to have to come back to an arranged marriage and take over his father's business, which he didn't want to do. So it's an interesting story about two different types of parenting. I didn't make that too explicit in the story, but that's really what the story is about. Uh, so uh, here's another bit. Uh, instead of cooperating further, Shaha Abdullak, uh, Farouk's father, instead of cooperating with the police, he consulted the London-based law firm Peters and Peter, Peters, Peter and Peters, experts in extradition law. Hmm, there's a coincidence. And then he employed David Wilson, the managing director of the public relations firm Bell Pottinger, to act as spokesman in the UK. On Thursday the 20th of March, so literally about what's that, five days after Martine's body was found, uh, and a week, almost a week after her disappearance, uh, Shaha Abdullak met the Yemeni's interior minister, apparently seeking guarantees that his son would not be handed over to the United Kingdom, despite evidence um, by the police's team um, that he was guilty. So basically, the police, their entire hands are, are totally tied with this. There's absolutely nothing to do. This is a government issue now. And it really is down to the governments to to battle it out and, and work out an extradition treaty. But it's probably never going to happen. Um, Rumours of, of, of uh, Farouk's whereabouts, uh, they're quite sporadic. Um, as I said, it's, it's, it's hard to accurately pin down exactly where he is. Um, when he arrived back in the Yemen, he was basically moved from hotel to hotel. His father owns a fleet of hotels, obviously, he's a billionaire. So his son was moved from hotel to hotel. Uh, it is believed he is in a family uh, property in a, a village about four hours, I think it's northeast of Sana, uh, in the, they say, al Ruk district. Um, and he, he keeps being moved around into various retreats in the countryside. Uh, oh, ah, yes. Um, uh, in the summer of 2009, a Norwegian documentary crew travelled to the Yemen uh, and they filmed the Abdullak family. And the lawyer for the Abdullak family, uh, they caught him on hidden camera admitting that Farouk lives at home with his family Um and as mentioned, studies Arabic and he's grown a beard and all that. Uh, and even though he's he's actually one of Britain's most wanted men, uh, he's uh, he's currently living in Thaba Abwas in southern Yemen. No. Lovely. Um, on the 10th of June 2010, so uh, roughly two hours later, uh, uh, Martin's father paid a tribute to the Metropolitan Police. He, he he keeps doing that. He keeps. This isn't one of those things where you turn around and go, the police are doing a shit job. Police did a cracking job. They nailed it within a couple of days. Literally, they they were like, it's him. It's there. We uh, we found the top in his flat. We found fingerprints. We found blood that matches hers. They found uh, semen inside her. They haven't determined that it was his, but I think we could probably guess that it was. Uh, and he keeps he keeps praising the police, saying they're doing a fantastic job. But this is at the point now where it's about governments, and the governments have been. They've been trying to do what they can, but literally, what can what can you do? You can't just force another country to hand someone over, because if you do that, then other countries are going to say, right, well, we want, we all have people that other countries want that we're holding. So once you give up one person, it's like the spy trade during World War Two. Uh, during the Cold War, the spy trade-off. So uh, if we if they give up Farouk, we're going to have to give up someone who's probably more important to us than he is. Um, but God knows. Uh, so uh, yeah, tenth uh, of June two thousand and ten, um, uh, a remembrance event was held at uh, Regent's College, uh, and a tree was planted <coughs> in Martin's memory. Um, something I didn't mention in this case, uh, it, it just didn't feel like it, it sat properly in there. But Regent's College, uh, Regent's Business College, which is now Regent's University, it's one of the, one of two privately funded universities in the United Kingdom. It's posh people. Um, it's it's literally a three minute walk from the aircrew receiving centre in Regent's Park, where the Blackout Ripper was was posted, and about a five minute walk from uh, his house, from his flat, where he was arrested. 
Um, so it's all all within the Blackout Ripper territory, but I didn't add it to the story because it just muddled, muddied things up. Um, as you probably noticed in that story, right at the end, I... Uh, oh, I'm going to have another drink. Oh, fresh orange juice. That is really nice. Um, I briefly mentioned in the story that he got remarried. I was going to make a big thing out of this, but I decided to speed up the end of the story. So I threw it in, hidden in there. So uh, if you didn't pick it up, he married. Yes. So um, interestingly, uh, this was mentioned by uh, uh, Martin's father. This is where we get most of the information from. He, he's got a lot of really good sources out there who are feeding him information back. Uh, and he said... It was still encouraging to learn that two Yemeni fathers deni denied having their daughters married to an internationally wanted suspect, despite the economic aspects uh, that they may have been part of such a, a proposed arrangement. It is interesting to see that for the same universal ethics, parental standards and care for daughters are the same in the Yemen as with most others throughout the world. Uh, so, yeah, um, Farouk in this was it's only about five years ago so 2013 autumn of 2013 he uh he married a divorced yemeni local woman and that's all we know about that although it's interesting there to say that two marriage proposals had been turned down so interesting that two yemeni fathers said i don't want my daughter to be married to this billionaire son so despite as poor as the families may be, or, you know, comparison to a billionaire, um, the father said no. So, um, um, so that's all I know about that case at the moment. I've put in pretty much all, most of that in there. Uh, if there is an update, I think I will do, definitely do an update on this case uh, and let you know how it's progressing. It's pretty slow at the moment. Um, obviously it's been 10 years on and there's still no update Farouk is still living free, he's married he's p probably finished his uh, education, he's probably living a good life he's probably having a lovely time not thinking about the woman who he raped and murdered why he murdered her we don't know why he raped her, we don't know all of these details we don't know It's uh, until until the, they go to court and the, the papers are released we, these are details that we just don't know so uh so everything that I do know, I've put into this story. Um, I thought I'd do um, a little thank you to uh, some old friends out there who are listeners as well. They've probably switched off by this point because <laughs> they probably... Why the hell would they... They spent their lives listening to me, so why the hell would they want to listen to me? Um, but I'll throw this in there, see if they do listen to this. They probably don't. But here we go. Uh... To old friends who are listeners to the podcast uh, are Barbie and Joe, PC Paul and his boss, the DCI Gemma. We know we know who the boss is, even in old. Uh, Mr. Jamie Corbett, Mr. Richard Harris, who I lost at the concert about two weeks ago. Sorry about that, Rich. Uh, Sarah Armstrong, Taffy and Wendy, the Norrises, the Norrises, is, 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 is. Mr. Bob Jones, Lappers, the Scouser, the Tood. Uh, I think that's it. I think that's all I've written at the moment. I'm sure there's more. If 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 there's anyone out there who who I've known for years who does listen to my podcast and hasn't let me know, get in touch. Let me know. Let me know that you're listening to this because you know it's a it's a it's a very quiet life being a podcaster. You talk and uh, nothing comes back the other way. Very rarely. It's nice. It's nice when people get in touch. It really does. It really warms my heart to hear people getting in touch saying oh i enjoyed this episode because sometimes what happens is you do an episode and it goes out and it just disappears into the ether and you think and sometimes like i i, go, I have to check i have to check that it did go out i go has anyone listened to it and i can see it being downloaded but do you know it's nice when people get in touch just saying hey i enjoyed that um noisy boat going past oh it's a rental boat oh shit bags oh fat people fat old boozy people Ugh. horrible boat oh god that Ugh. holiday renters Ugh. disgusting people although they probably think the same about us proper boaters they probably think that we're itinerant little shitbags <laughs> so um oh yeah this is on my list oh dear okay i thought i'd explain last week's teary moment uh <laughs> You noticed I, I got a bit choked up 
and I, I struggled through some of Extra Mile. I'm sure some of you right now are going, oh, great, I'll go and listen to that and downloading last week's episode. Uh, last week's case was the Larry Winters case. As I said, it was a little bit difficult for me to try and write that because I was trying to find the angle on it. Uh, but when you strip away the fact that this is about a story about a guy with a mental illness, which was untreated, again, this is kind of like this week's episode. What this is about was about... Basically, he was, you know, he, was, he was only young, he was only 21, but throughout his whole life, he was kind of, he was always, he always wanted his mum to be there, uh, and she couldn't be, could, oh, oh, oh shit, I almost tipped over my drink, but, you know, he was in hospital sick as a young boy, then he ended up in Borstal, then he ended up in prison, and then he ended up dead, and it, all he ever wanted was his mum to be there, um, and I'd, I found it a little bit upsetting, so I got a little bit teary at the end. Uh, joy next to mile and on the record as well I think I think it is because I think I was thinking about my own mum this week um, and it's, it's it's been kind of weird over the years you know a couple of years ago with all of her her illnesses we found out she got dementia which was kind of hidden amongst all of her mental illnesses there was a lot going on in her head and I could kind of see that there's some I remember messaging my brother and saying I think I think mum has dementia i think there's something in there it's hidden away but i can see it coming through uh so we had a lot to deal with that um we spent many years sorting out mum's life uh trying to get her help and all that and now mum's in a care home there's not a lot left of her anymore she's you know she's she's pretty much a shell we don't she doesn't really communicate there's not really a lot going on anymore um so anyone who deal anyone who's got a relative who's got like a, a very advanced dementia it is kind of a weird thing to have because it's kind of you know, physically mum's still there physically mum still exists but mentally she's not there anymore and technically do you know really mum's kind of dead really do you know the soul is dead it's the personality that makes a person not really the functions so so the mum that we remember isn't there anymore. So kind of if you are someone who's looking after someone with dementia, it's kind of a hard hard thing because, you know, the person, the person, the, the, their soul has died, their personality has died, but you haven't had time to grieve, really. Do you know, if, if someone does die, you've got a grave to go to. You've got somewhere to go, but dementia is a hard thing because, you know, they're, they're still there but they're not there anymore and that's it's it's kind of a very confusing place so i i think larry winter's story just ju i think it just hit me uh and then it came across in the, in the extra mile uh so so no blubbing this week uh i'm being a, being a good boy this week no blubbing so <laughs> although i did have a couple of tears during write, writing this episode about my team um because it was a sad story and uh no. lovely lady d didn't do anything wrong didn't hurt anyone had it came from a loving family got murdered got murdered not not by uh, not by from what we can see not by an asshole from someone who looked like even though he's billionaire and it was polite and p people said polite and passive and quite shy and you know he wouldn't hurt a fly and you know something happened we don't know what it is we won't, and we won't know until he's arrested. Until he's arrested, and even if if he is arrested, he probably won't talk. So we'll probably never know why he did it. And given how long time is going by, he'll probably by that point, if he is if is ever arrested, he'll probably invent some kind of bullshit excuse. He'll probably say, "Oh, I, I blacked out. I had too much alcohol. I, I had too much cocaine. I don't remember it." Uh, which ten years on, you can't prove any of that. Oh. God, I need to do a happier story of one day. Maybe I'll just make a comedy podcast. <laughs> this is depressing. <laughs> so, um, each week I ask for questions uh, that you can post me. Lovely, lovely questions. Um, so, uh, I thought I'd send through... So, uh, uh, poor little Nell on Instagra Instagram sent me this one. Uh, which was, fantastic question, would you ever considering a consider doing a live murder mile show maybe at the edinburgh fringe festival i'm gonna have a drink ah, leaving you in suspense with my answer and the answer is no okay next question no i'm like actually yeah i'd love to 
because obviously a lot of my, a lot of my writing started at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival writing plays performing uh, it's why I love doing my guided tours every week because it is performance for me I, lo I still love writing tends to do the podcast uh, yeah I'd love to do a live version of the show maybe get maybe get people involved oh maybe get people involved maybe get people to read out the lines <gasps> I'd have to find the right story to do that wouldn't I hmm could be interesting yeah I'd, I'd love to i'd love to do a live version of the show one day uh i've been asked to do live presentations about murder which uh hopefully i'll be doing soon uh but at the moment no plans uh podcast takes up all the time really does uh, i thought i'd throw into a new bit a new bit into uh this part of extra mile uh hang on let me just write something uh That's good. So it's a note for myself. I'm not going to say what it says. Ooh, ooh thrills and excitement. Um, I thought I'd throw a new bit into here. Um, obviously, uh, I, as I mentioned above, I have a friend called Mr. Bob Jones. I've known Mr. Bob Jones since college. I think we did drama together. Uh, we're still in touch today. God, these people who are still in touch with me today. Idiots. Why, are they, why do they do this? Uh, and Bob always says that every time on the podcast where I say... And yet, he always imagines uh, the kind of War of the Worlds, you know, the, the, the narration at the start of War of the Worlds, you know, uh, on the Jeff Wayne version, uh, narrated by Richard Burton. So for Bob, I thought I'd add this in, uh, and I'm going to do uh, the opening of War of the Worlds in the style of Richard Burton. There we go. Obviously, the word and yet doesn't appear in there. What is it? We'll find out. Okay, I'll read this bit. Ready? <clears throat> no one would have believed in the last few years of the 19th century that human, that human affairs were being watched from the timeless worlds of space. No one would have dreamed we were being scrutinized as someone with a microscope studies creatures that swarm and multiply in a drop of water. Few men ever considered the possibilities of life on other planets. And yet, across the gulf of space, minds, immeasure, minds immeasurably superior to ours regarded this earth with envious eyes, and slowly and surely they drew their plans against us. Dun dun dun! Diddler, diddler! Dun, 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 diddly, diddly. Little tribute to Jeff Wayne's War of the Worlds, if you've never seen it. Obviously, War of the Worlds was written by H.G. Wells, which was adapted by Orson Wells into the Mercury Theatre version of, of War of the Worlds, which is fantastic. If you've never listened to it before, download it. It's fantastic. Well, that is uh, the version from uh, War the, uh, Jeff Wayne's War of the Worlds, the kind of 1970s, 1980s disco version that I remember growing up with uh, at, at school. Uh, if you couldn't play an instrument, our um, uh, music uh, teacher, I forgot that he teached, I thought he just pissed around. Our music teacher uh, used to play that a lot, uh, as well as making us watch Bugsy Malone because he couldn't be asked to teach us if we didn't play an instrument. Uh, so, a um, new bit. If you if you want to hear me quote anything, uh, just just message me. And uh, I'm, I'm such a whore. I'll, probably, I'll happily do that. <laughs> um, I, as I mentioned last week, uh, I was... Oh, God, I was uh, quite behind with the podcast and I was worried that uh, I may have to put in an extra mile in the next week or so just to just to get me back on track because I was getting very behind because the first episode took meant each episode is meant to take six days the first one took eight days then the next one took nine days and then literally the last one though the, the uh Larry Winters one uh that took 10 days no no that took yeah 10 or 11 days so I was about five days behind really running behind so I tried to get myself back on track with this one. I've been working, I've been working day and night, editing at night and writing and re uh, researching during the day, trying to get myself back on track. It is now Thursday afternoon in the sweltering heat. I've just recorded this. Uh, hopefully, this is going to be an easy edit. The last ones have been really complicated. I've do, I've written this as an e easy uh, 
story. I don't think it'll require a lot of sounds. I, hopefully I can do it all with music. Uh, and I just want to make it nice and simple because the others have been very complicated. But I hope you've enjoyed the fact that they are complicated. Um, what I've been doing is uh, trying to have a lot of fun with the sound. So as you know, what I try not to do, I hate when people do, oh, a man walked into a room, clump, clump, clump. He opened the door. He closed the door. All that kind of shit. I hate when someone says something and then you hear the sound. The phone rang. Bring, 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 bring. It's like we all know what a phone sounds like. So I deliberately don't do that. But what I try to do is, for me, the sounds are about uh, creating an emotion inside you. So not just not just recreating the world, but trying to... Uh, not as much making it sound authentic, but making it feel, making it feel in your heart or, or somewhere hidden in the back of your head. I want it to help your imagination flow as opposed to just recreating the sounds. So obviously what I do is when I say today I'm standing on blah, 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 and uh, you know, you hear the sound of the street. That's fine. That's normally as it is. I normally mess around with the sounds a little bit. I record that street on a particular day. Although it's hard to recreate the full what the street is about within a couple of seconds, I do kind of edit it slightly and you know re-engineer some of the sounds so you can hear. Like if if, if there's construction work or if there's uh, buskers, you know, I try and I, I kind of heighten some of the sounds. But with some of the other episodes, I tried to have a lot of fun with it. So the Larry Winters episode, which was a bitch to edit, but I enjoyed it. I had a lot of fun with that. So not only did I mess with the narrative, I, you know, you had two false endings and I didn't do the, uh, I stopped before the, you know, as it was here on the, 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 and then we do the, you know, I, I took us back to the night of the murder immediately before going back to the early life of Larry Winters because I felt that was important and what if, if you listen to that listen to the background really carefully what I've done with that is instead of recreating as I think the street would have sounded in 1964 which is hard to replicate what I did with that was try to replicate the feelings inside Larry Winters head as he's walking along the street so you kind of feel how he feels at that moment so you, you, you the solitariness of you hearing his his feet walking along the road you know you don't hear much of you don't hear traffic going past it's his feet walking along the road uh you hear a crow in the background um it kind of, always an ominous sound uh you hear the sound you can hear uh, uh people having fun you can hear music being pumped from clubs and it's all very normal and then what i do as he approaches the white horse if you listen very carefully I've done it on kind of a slightly sub level, so it's not as obvious. So hopefully you won't have noticed it, but hopefully your subconscious brain will have noticed it. And what I've done is in the background, uh, you hear the crow again and your brain will go, oh, it's the crow again, but it's not the crow again. It's the crow in reverse. So I've reversed the sound and put it back in and and merged into it the sounds of the people talking in the bars. That's reversed as well. So seamlessly you won't have noticed it but it, it, it's a hubbub but it goes in reverse and then you hear uh you hear a police siren go past normally and then a little bit later you hear it again but it's in reverse but it's slight but it's, again it's slight same with music coming from uh, the the nearby club that's reversed as well and i make it quite subtle there even his heartbeat is reversed when you hear that do 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 that's reversed as well so i'm deliberately playing with the sounds having a bit of fun there and then later on when we finally do get to the point where he shoots paddy o'keefe if we I've gone a bit gorilla with that. I've had a bit of fun with it. And I've been, I haven't been been uh, slight with the sounds. I've been really obvious with it. I've really gone to town and thrown in the sounds. So it's cause it's quite glaring and clashing. And it's it's good fun. I did the same when, you know, when uh, Larry Winters went to Scotland. And you hear the train going up to Scotland. Uh, like I did last week uh, with the Helen Pickwood episode where the train is going up north. I split the sound in half. And I... I tailored it so it, it, it sounds as if it's going from the middle of your hearing to your right ear. So it's going into the distance. That was a real pig to create because um, I had to create uh, 
it wasn't even stereo sound, it was mono sound, and I had to take two mono tracks and basically morph them to make it sound like they were going, it was going into your right ear, which it wasn't, because it, it, the sound doesn't do that, but I'm, that's what I'm trying to do at the moment, is, is have a bit more fun with it. So hopefully it's, it's more of an experience for you, and you kind of get more of a feeling. Uh, but obviously, yeah, yeah uh, Larry Winters went to, um, when he went to the Highlands, there were some sounds in there, uh, and it, I did the same on that. It kind of, it, it goes nice. The train it takes him up to Scotland. You hear the sounds of birds tweeting. You hear a babbling brook, and you go, "Oh, this is really nice." But then it merges, and then if you listen carefully, the babbling brook is in reverse, and the birds are in reverse as well. And then the train is in reverse, so it's it's like his whole life is collapsing. So I was having a lot of fun with that. I was hoping to do like a Hunter S. Thompson style. <sighs> Thing with lots of you know some terry gilliam in there uh so i had fun with that but this time hopefully this episode i'm just gonna do it i'm just gonna put some nice music in um just keep it nice and simple i think that's our ears require a nice simple one and my shattered ability requires simplicity as well um so I've decided to do something today, which is very nice because of all the lovely Patreon supporters who've been very supportive. I, I asked I asked them whether they wanted um, uh, Patreon uh, early episodes on Patreon. Many of them have said that they're not interested in it. I, I, do you know what? I entirely agree with this uh, because the great thing about being a podcaster is when an episode is released you can talk to your friends about it you can talk to all the people who you've just met or who do you know who you know through podcasting and you could talk about the episode whereas if you're a patreon supporter and you get your episode a week early you've got no one to talk to and by the time the episode goes out you've forgotten about it so uh so i agree with that i know that my my patreon supporters aren't really keen on that at the moment um but uh, what I'm, I'm doing this week is I'm going to send them uh, some free uh, murder exclusive murder mile badges, fridge magnets and murder mile stickers that you can only get by either doing the the competition of which each week there may only be one winner. Uh, this week's episode, there was there will only be one winner. But my Patreon supporters will all get one. Uh, they can just message me and they get a thank you card for me as well. <laughs> How amazing is that? And I also do, sometimes I record things on my phone, like when I'm researching and I, I, I upload it to uh, Patreon. I apologise to Patreon supporters. I would do a hell of a lot more for you, but the Patreon app on the phone is bloody awful. It's really shit. Patreon, please sort it out. It's like, it's like if you want to upload a photo, you can only upload one and that's it. Whereas, you know me, I like to upload 10 and go, look, look, this is that. This is this building on this day. This is it 50 years ago. This is this person. That, uh, you can't do that. You can upload one photo. You can't up upload any footage. You can't record anything on your phone and upload it. Then you ha I have to come all the way home to do that. And it's a real pig. And especially as I run off battery power. I only have like three hours power, so I don't really... And sometimes I don't have internet uh, where I am. I don't have enough bandwidth or power to be able to upload stuff. So it's a real pig. So Patreon, please sort it out so I can send some lovely stuff to my Patreon supporters. So that was uh, episode 38. Hope everyone enjoyed that. Um, different episode that's what I'm trying to do is make sure you have different episodes each week I don't know what next week's episode is going to be I've got some choices uh, I've got some new ones coming in that I need to start researching soon but I definitely have enough episodes planned to keep me going until January then I'll take a little bit of a break probably probably about four to six weeks uh, I'll put a couple of episodes going out there to keep you occupied but apart from that we've got loads to go and then and then we'll be back for season three ha 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 thank you so much um if you enjoy murder mile please do uh uh tell people that you know uh if 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 you're on any forums or anything um uh, if uh, you know it'd be really really appreciated if someone just just posts on there hey th this is murder mile i absolutely love it you should listen to it blah 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 it's only takes only takes a little bit but you know it really helps get new listeners to the podcast and the the more people i can get listening to this the longer i can keep going uh still not making it, any money off it <laughs> thank god for patreon supporters they're keeping me alive uh advertising i'm not making anything at the moment or maybe i am and they just haven't invoiced me i don't know 
God, I'm hungry. Uh, anyway, that's Murder Marvel this week. That was episode 38. Hope you enjoyed that. Uh, I haven't got a sign off for this week, so I'm just going to uh, raise my glass to you all. Oh, my ice has melted. Bollocks. My I was gonna just, I was gonna wiggle it at you. Uh, I'm raising my glass to you. I'm gonna say cheers to you all, and I look forward to <laughs> coming in your ears next week. <laughs> shouldn't have said that that was really bad uh, i look forward to, i look forward to uh oh fuck it bye <laughs>